Hello, I am Rami Niranjan Desai and this interview is a part of a series of interviews that I'm doing for Global Order, India's biggest global affairs platform with an audience spread around 60 countries. Through these conversations with key policy makers and analysts, I hope to look at the world through an Indian or at the very least an Indo-Pacific lens and understand how to put the news in its proper geographical context. Global Order was built to see and understand the world beyond the usual Western understanding and gaze and shift the center of gravity of analysis to the Indo-Pacific. My guest today is a much decorated naval officer. Admiral Jayanath Kalambage is a Sri Lankan naval officer and a diplomat. He has been Sri Lanka's foreign secretary and as a career naval officer, he has also served as the commander of the Sri Lankan Navy. Sir, welcome. And it is really an honor to have you with us today. Sir, you have been the commander of the Sri Lankan Navy as well as a diplomat. So let me begin by asking you, what has been the impact of Sri Lanka's economic crisis on its diplomatic efforts? Well, you see, for a country to be having a robust uh, international relations policy, there are three things needed, in my opinion. One is the political stability. Number two is economic stability. Number three is social stability. Now, if you look back uh, uh, on this uh, case of Sri Lanka, we did not have all the three. We did not have political stability and the society was protesting and economically we were going down the drain. So when these three were not there, when these three are not there, it is very difficult for an independent sovereign state to stand firm in the international arena and to have kind of their own international foreign policies. And now we need to stabilize these three. Right now, I would say that the political stability has come back. The parliament is functioning. President, prime minister and the ministries are now functioning. They are delivering uh, the task uh, assigned to them. That is good. The society has come to terms with the situation that they believe that we have to bear these hardships for another period uh, until things can improve. Then economy also showing signs of getting improved, like inflation is coming down uh, gradually. Prices of essential commodities has come down uh, slightly. That is good news. And no more queues for petrol or, I mean, fuel or gas. That is a positive. But it, we are not over yet. It's not the situation is not normal yet. So we have to really work very hard to stabilize our economy with the support of uh, bilateral partners like India, China, Japan, and international partners like IMF, World Bank, Asia Development Bank, things like that. So we, as fast as we can, we must stabilize our economy and a stable, economically stable Sri Lanka is in the interest of India because we are just the southern tip of your beautiful country. And it is in the interest of the whole region, the Indian Ocean region. When the 2004 tsunami hit, Indian warships were here before you could actually rescue your own people. And uh, when the Express Pearl incident uh, took place, that is burning of the ship, Indian ships were here working with the Sri Lankan Navy Coast Guard and also COVID, the first consignment of AstraZeneca, half a million uh, vaccination uh, came from Maitri vaccine from India. So India has been a great uh, friend in need as always. But I wish that uh, we can be more uh, robust in our foreign policy uh, sometimes say no to certain initiatives, uh, sometimes to embrace initiatives which are beneficial to the country. So that is how I look at uh, international scene uh, from the Sri Lankan perspective. So that uh, you responded that very candidly. I mean, taking responsibility uh, is something that we don't see very often. But, you know, of course, India and Sri Lanka have been really old friends and good friends. But there's also a lot of support that Sri Lanka possibly can receive from the world at this time, you know, not just India. You know, it's a time of crisis. What do you think that uh, Sri Lanka expects from the world? What sort of uh, um, uh, help can, you know, it needs? 
Well, you see, I think right now, as I mentioned, these three criteria, political, economic, and social stability, we were, we did not have it, right? But right now, politically, we are stabilized and the parliament is functioning. So the most important thing for Sri Lanka right now is to stabilize its economy and let it start functioning as a circular economic again uh, economy again you know earning money spending earning money spending and benefit to the people so in that sense india has already i think bailed us out about 4 billion us dollars i think that's a great thing i uh, no country has done that to sri lanka that kind of a help to sri lanka if not for that help uh, we are not bankrupt. We will be, I think, rotting in somewhere down the line in, in hell, basically, I would say. Right. So therefore, but India also cannot bail out uh, Sri Lanka throughout its time. Right. India can help. And of course, we need the support of international bilateral lenders, international monetary organizations and World Bank, Asia Development Bank, uh, JICA. Uh, all these help we need to stabilize Sri Lankan economy. But having said that, we have to make play, play our part. We can't expect the world to come and rescue us or bail us out and happily go on spending uh, our money uh, not for the intended purpose, right? We don't have that luxury. So unless we have good monetary policies internally as well as externally, you know, even taking a loan, we have to be double careful about taking a loan, whether we have the ability to pay it back. That's the first question we should ask. How beneficial that project going to be and benefit for whom? Is it for the ruling, ruling elite or for the masses? These are the areas where we have gone wrong. So we need a lot of support from the international community, international organization, bilateral lenders, multilateral lenders, because right now we have gone to the IMF and we hope that the IMF bailout, uh, now they have uh, arrived at the staff level agreement, but then it need to go beyond that because we need to restructure our debt how best we can do it. India has very openly said India is willing to help us to restructure our debt. And India like to play a role, a kind of a catalyst getting other people on board as well. So we need a lot of support. And it is in the interest, not only for Sri Lanka, because you don't need another instable country at southern tip of your big country. You would like to have a stable Sri Lanka because if we are unstable, we become vulnerable. I think that is not in the interest of India. That is not in the interest of the Indian Ocean. That is not in the interest of the world, basically. I mean, you don't want to have another uh, Somalia, another Yemen uh, kind of a situation in the southern tip of your beautiful country. So we need a lot of support. We, But having said that, I repeated, repeat what I said. We have to have our monetary policies right. We don't have the luxury of spending, uh, you know, welfare subsidies for political gains. That's been a problem in Sri Lanka. You know, we bring rice from the moon to give the people so that you win the votes. That culture need to change. Well, uh, you know, quite right, sir. You mentioned uh, about uh, the ability for Sri Lanka to uh, pay back its uh, loans, uh, to be very careful about that. Um, so let me ask you a question here. You know, there's been a lot of concern that has been expressed, uh, especially in India and the United States, uh, about the docking of, a, you know, Chinese missile tracking vehicle at the Ahmed Tota port, uh, which received a lot of funding from China. Um, there has been a, a lot of uh, concerns in this regard about uh, this sort of debt trap uh, diplomacy too. What would you then say about that? Well, I mean, honestly, I'm giving you a very sincere opinion because I don't hold any government position or I don't have any uh, representation anywhere. So I can talk very freely. To begin with the debt trap, you know, if you take the overall external debt of Sri Lanka, it is less than 10% that we owe to China. So therefore, that total argument that Sri Lanka is in this situation because of a debt trap uh, policy of China is not right. It is our own wrongdoings. You know, it's, it's China. We have taken loans. Yes, we have taken loans for certain projects which are not 
uh, viable, that is also true. Uh, we have to pay back, that is also true. But it's only 10% of our external debt. We, are, we have more uh, amounts to pay for other bilateral lenders, other international organizations like ADB and the World Bank, right? So therefore, this debt trap policy per se, uh, it is not right. It is, you know, we have been selling internal international sovereign bonds and financial facilities to make money. Now we have to pay back. We have to pay the interest, right? So that is our, I mean, our economic model has failed us. You know, they say that uh, we were living a, a champagne-style life with only uh, a toddy uh, income. <laughs> you know, toddy is a drink, uh, alcoholic beverage, the ordinary yeah. workers drink, right? So with that kind of an income, we were living a champagne-style life. So that doesn't sustain, right? So therefore, point number one, the, the debt trap, it's not exactly that. Yes, we have done that. And then the point uh, two is you mentioned about the, the Chinese uh, survey vessel docking in Hambantota. Now, there again, I must say that the accusation or sometimes we hear that uh, Hambantota is a Chinese port and Hambantota can be uh, used by the Chinese military uh, to uh, carry out uh, some launching attack or carry out some threatening uh, maneuvers to other countries, especially to India. Now, there again, it's not true. If you remember when the Chinese ship was cleared to come and we said no, I mean, we said don't come now because India expressed concern and we did not want to go back to 2014 where we did not consult uh, India and allow two Chinese submarines to come and dock in Colombo. And that kind that really antagonized uh, India and that raised alarm bells in, in Indian strategic community. So we did not want to do that. Now, that is why we said, OK, don't come now. We will tell you when to come. So that much authority we have in the port of Hambantota. Right now, port of Hambantota, yes, it is given to a, a Chinese merchant, China merchant port holding for a 99 year lease in 2017. But still, the operation and especially the security aspect of it is totally controlled by the government of Sri Lanka. You know, in Sri Lanka, we have a very unique situation where the port security, we call call it International Ships and Port Facility Security Code, ISPS Code. The ISPS Code, the authority, competent authority and the designated authority in Sri Lanka is the Sri Lanka Navy. Now, this is a very unique situation. No other country in the world that I know, the Navy is doing that. So that means without the approval and the consent of the Sri Lanka Navy, no ship either a merchant vessel or a warship can enter a port in Sri Lanka. And that is the same with Hambantota port as well. So therefore, this Chinese uh, survey vessel coming to uh, Hambantota, it's not because it is uh, operated by China merchant port holding. It is not. They could not come. And finally, after some consultation, we said, OK, now you can come. But then we put the uh, certain condition that you can't do this, this, this. I mean, because we did not want this ship to come into port of Hambantota and start, you know, gathering intelligence or anything against another country, right? I mean, but having said that, you know, we should not really over uh, rate this issue as well. If you look at uh, the warships visiting Sri Lanka, I think from 2009 to, to date, about 675 warships have visited Sri Lanka. That is a huge number for a small country like Sri Lanka. And we are extremely happy about it. Why? Because every time a ship comes, we earn money, right? But if you ask me who topped the list, obviously it is India, right? Indian warships have been in Sri Lanka because you are in the neighborhood. You are on the way from eastern coast to southern coast. You stop here. And we do a lot of bilateral training, bilateral exercises. And largest number has come from India. And second is Japan. Right. And third, right, way down the number is China. Right. So China, Russia, Pakistan, Bangladesh, they are at one level where India uh, is number one. So there again, warships visiting Sri Lanka is not a big deal. Of course, we are a kind of a free country. Uh, they like to come. Uh, of course, for another country, it may be a symbolic visit. It may be operational visit. It may be to say, say that uh, we are there. So that's also there. 
but i think india i think understood that okay we will permit it we will not make it a further issue let it come and go uh, because you see now with the advancement of technology a ship need not come to the a port to gather intelligence of the area they can do very well do it at sea right they don't have to even transmit anything we can they can be on the passive mode while on a innocent passage you know we have this concept called innocent passage without showing anything they can do it so i think that issue is now behind us uh, that taught us a good lesson as far as sri lanka is concerned we considered that vessel only as a visit of another warship from another country so uh, let me ask you sir you know the economic crisis and you know the very persistent uh, high inflation has that made your country reevaluate some of its diplomatic choices uh, uh, for instance you know china and india well i think uh, the current president has been very clear that we will never try to choose one against the other we would not bandwagon with one against the other we would not want to choose one or the other we want to benefit as you ask in the beginning from every country right we need to be benefit from every country and india is always there but we cannot depend on india totally and we need other countries and china has become a, a major development uh, economic partner in sri lanka especially after ending the war in 2019 may 19 now we can't just throw that away we can't just say okay china out only india so our talent our uh, way forward will be how best we can balance all these relations now in 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 sri lankan's foreign policy the non alignment per se will be the best way out i mean we can't really be bandwagon uh, with one group against the other we can't choose one against the other we don't want to be in that position but having said that we have made it very clear to everyone as far as strategic security is concerned india is number 1 because india's strategic security umbrella especially in the sea and on the air space is intricately linked to that of sri lanka you know that is why uh, the former nsa mr shivashankar menon mentioned that sri lanka is an aircraft carrier which is parked only 14 miles away from uh, india that is true right but it is true both ways it is true in both ways something happening in sri lanka can impact on india strategic security wise at the same time when india wants to really control matters across the indian ocean uh, so to say sri lanka can be a good player good partner right now right now we have a very good uh, working relations between the two navies two coast guards and also now we are linked through the uh, scheme of maritime domain awareness bangla uh, pa- maldives sri lanka and india now these are great things right so i reiterate yes we need everybody uh, we are trying to balance our foreign relations but as far as strategic security concerns are concerned are related india is number one because we don't want we don't have to be and we will never be a strategic security concern to india so then let me ask you has this uh, crisis also then had any impact on sri lanka's defense forces well you see i honestly don't have any inside knowledge about the defense forces i retired about 8 years ago but you know i read in between you know i read uh, lines in between and the direct answer is yes right you see there was there is a i, I don't have to hide it is not a secret you know we did not have enough fuel to operate our warships right now we took we got fuel from india from kochi right of course australian government i think gave uh, paid for it uh, but then we we sent our big ships to kochi got fuel came here and then redistributed to our fleet so that means the economic Uh, the situation has really impact the armed forces and also then uh, acquiring new technology uh, acquiring new defense equipment everything is kind of uh, at a halt right now because we uh, can't afford i mean our priority right now 
he used to buy fuel, gas, medicine, and essential food items, right? Not necessarily uh, to upgrade the, the, the military uh, per se. Now, that is where I think we need to work more closely with the Indian military because, you know, we, we must piggyback, I use this word, piggyback on the capabilities of the Indian Navy, especially and Indian Air Force, of course, Indian Navy and the Coast Guard, because, you know, why should we spend so much of money looking after this region when we can work collaboratively with other navies, especially India? Quite right, sir. So then in the light of that, you know, also uh, the Ukraine-Russia war, everybody is also looking at the Indo-Pacific, uh, you know, the relationships that have been developed by India in this region to keep it from uh, Chinese aggression. Uh, what do you feel Sri Lanka's role in the future of the Indo-Pacific can be? Well, you see, now the world has five oceans. Right. I think we must keep them as five. But when then when we link Indian and the Pacific Ocean, the, there are a few questions that we need to ask and get answered. Whose interest is this confluence of the ocean? We know that it started by Prime Minister Abe in 2007. But actually before that, uh, Commodore Gurpit Kurana from Indian Navy mentioned about this Indo-Pacific concept, I think we, even before 2007, right? So it is a concept which has been on air. And also uh, uh, now, as I mentioned, whose interest, the confluence of the ocean? Is it India's interest? Of course, yes, India is a big country. You have a uh, widespread uh, uh, linkage. But I don't know, I haven't seen this initiated from India. I mean, the Indo-Pacific concept or the construct were initiated by Japan, by America, uh, now uh, European Union, UK, uh, Australia, uh, South Korea, they all have kind of joined this uh, Indo-Pacific construct. So we need to find out the reason as to why it is important to link the two. Uh, although I said we don't have to link the Indian and the Pacific Ocean, the oceans are linked anyway. I mean, although we try to uh, separate them geographically, the oceans are linked anyway. But you see, Indian Ocean is relatively peaceful. Now, I give credit to India for maintaining that being the major power in the Indian Ocean, right? Whereas the conflict area is the Western Pacific, right? So when you link a very peaceful ocean, Relatively, I'm saying, of course, Indian Ocean also has a certain issues, especially in the Western Indian Ocean or the Arabian uh, uh, Sea. But by and large, Indian Ocean is peaceful. But when you link that with a very contentious, conflict-prone area, that is the Western Pacific, so we are kind of dragged into uh, another a bigger, uh, big players game. So that is why I say we need to ask uh, in whose interest this Indo-Pacific construct is. Now, we believe that Indian Ocean should be Indian Ocean, right? In 1971, Sri Lanka moved Indian Ocean as a zone of peace. We did not want further nuclearization of the ocean, Indian Ocean. We did not want, want the further militarization of the uh, Indian Ocean. We did not want further establishment of military bases in the Indian Ocean. And everybody agreed at that time. But it did not succeed because, you know, the major powers at that time, uh, they did not want that to happen, right? Now, fast track that to about 43 years, uh, even more, we, we kind of expect the same thing. We don't want further nuclearization. We don't want further militarization. We don't want conflict in the Indian Ocean. We want an Indian Ocean to be a peaceful ocean where the maritime trade is flourishing because I, I people argue which is the most important ocean in the world. I would argue Indian Ocean is the most important ocean in the world, mainly because it is the energy highway. I think in the foreseeable future, although we talk about uh, renewable energy, alternative energy sources, I think in the foreseeable future, at least for the next two decades, we will depend on the hydrocarbons or the fossil fuel coming from the Persian Gulf, the whole world. Right. So therefore, Indian Ocean is the gateway for that uh, oil and gas. So we would, uh, therefore, the importance of Indian Ocean to the world, world sustaining is really great. 
right so therefore i don't think we need to lower the importance of indian ocean by linking with the uh, pacific ocean but of course yes now we i don't think we can divorce them because they are kind of united in a marriage of convenience so might as well work but i i i want to stress another point if you look at the indian ocean and the pacific ocean together there are so many strategies like japan has free and open indo pacific strategy us has indo pacific strategy then european union has indo pacific strategy then asean has uh, asean outlook for indo pacific strategy india has their own uh, strategy australia has korea has uk has everyone is having a strategy for the indian and the pacific ocean but where is our strategy where is indian ocean strategy by the indian ocean for the indian ocean is a question that i like to ask that is the question i think we the the strategic thinkers policy makers decision makers and i always said in every meeting i attend every forum i firmly believe iora indian ocean rim association which is actually initiated by india and led by india and as the widest participation within the indian ocean literals as well as outside powers is the best platform to devise or to come out with the indian ocean strategy right we need to maintain the sanctity the peace and stability of the indian ocean for our sake and for the sake of the world now we should not really only dance to the other initiatives we have to have our own initiative and i hope that india will take the leadership in that but having said that we should never have or we should not have exclusive kind of ideas because what we need is a inclusive indian ocean everyone is free to use the indian ocean safe navigation overflight as long as they are not harming any other country they as long as they don't show military uh, or objectives right for peaceful purposes especially the trade and obtaining resources and even exploring the seabed right for peaceful purposes indian ocean should be peaceful and open to all thank you sir you know on that note i think you've really given us a great insight into sri lanka situation and the indo pacific so thank you very much sir for taking out the time and joining us today and i really hope to have you again on our show on the global order thank you sir